from the studios at Hull Bay Productions. This is the Power Play. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being with us uh, this evening. This is the Power Play show. We know the man, we know the story, we know the accused, and now we know the verdict. Welcome to the Power Play show. I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. We are coming to you this evening as the nation has just learned the fate of former Minneapolis police officer Derek, Derek Chauvin. The jury deliberated for less than 11 hours and returned a verdict of guilty on all charges in the death of George Floyd. Chauvin faces up to 40 years in prison for second degree murder, up to 25 years for third degree murder, and up to 10 years for second degree manslaughter. With me this evening, and I appreciate you gentlemen taking some time with me, uh, let's begin uh, with Attorney Joseph Feaster. Uh, we have Bishop Lawrence Ward of the Abundant Life Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Pastor Kenneth M. Young of Calvary Baptist Church in Calvary. Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for being with me this evening on the Power Play. Thank you very much, Tonya. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you for having us. I want to start with you, uh, Attorney Feaster, because um, less than 11 hours, and when you got in, and you, you actually text me right away, too, as my phone started kind of blowing up. What were your initial thoughts? Uh, you, were you surprised that we were back so early? Just give me where, where your thoughts were when this was happening. Well, Tonya, first and foremost, thank you for having me on this program and thank you for having me on with uh, Bishop Young and, and Reverend uh, Ward. Uh, I know you started with me because I like to start good trouble. So, uh, you know, so let me be consistent. Uh, I really didn't have a sense of how long the jury would be. I mean, uh, you know, and even have mixed emotions, even having heard the verdict because I've been so, so traumatized and ambivalent about notwithstanding all of the evidence that I saw with my own eyes and heard with my own ears, whether it would in fact be a conviction. So I, as, as an attorney, even though I don't practice in criminal law, when they came back that, that uh, shorter period of time, relatively speaking, I felt very confident at that point that there's going to be a guilty verdict, but I can tell you, I had to wait to exhale. Uh, you know, even though I felt a, a sense of confidence in the time frame, I still was uncertain up to that point. And that's really, that's a sad commentary based upon the evidence that we saw. Bishop Ward, I called you last minute. <laughs> I called you probably about 40 minutes ago. Um, what were your thoughts when you first heard that one, the verdict was in and then listening to the verdict being read? Well, thank you for having me on, Tonya. Uh, I was certainly surprised that it, it came through that quickly. I was thinking about Thursday, maybe Friday, uh, that the verdict would be um, in. Um, I think my, my all along was kind of like pins and needles, especially this morning I was listening and they talked about the statistics of a guilty verdict coming out and all of these history of cases of, you know, just murders in, you know, where the police were shooting African-Americans uh, and, and how they had a thousand of them and like maybe only 44 ended up where it was actually a, a guilty charge, maybe about 40, 44, something like that. And I said, boy, this is going to be an uphill battle. On the other side of it, there was, a, there was like, wow, a sense of relief because like, finally, I can see what justice looks like. Mm. Yeah. Pastor Ken, I also called you at the last minute. And, um, you know, what what were your thoughts? You you have been, I know you've been covering this trial. I know that you, you, you know, you've been discussing it amongst uh, your congregants and, and just on social media as well. So tell me what your reactions were when you heard the verdict being read. Yes, uh, thank you again, Tony, for having me. Uh, a sense of relief, uh, the sense of uh, being able to exhale uh, for a moment. Um, but in the back of my mind, honestly, it was like, what happens to Dante Wright? What happens to uh, the young uh, Mr. Toledo in, in Chicago, right? Um, but it's not just that. Following uh, this trial, 
you start to hear more about the way uh, people of color are being treated in Minneapolis. And so right before I came on, uh, one woman said, we're in a police state, a militarized state right now, where so much uh, that's happening around us and this shouldn't be. And so my thoughts were like, this is great. This is, to me, it's not really justice because he's no longer here with us. Mm. Um, but it is a sense of, um, some sense of accountability uh, that you just can't go around putting your knee on people for minutes and nothing happens to you. So I think that that's uh, initial reactions. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up um, Dante Wright and 13-year-old Adam Toledo, both who were involved in um, police-involved shootings during the course of this trial. So, Joe, you know, I wonder, it, it, it seems a bit bittersweet that here we have this verdict that we were all hoping would go the right way. As, as you said, Pastor Ken, it does not bring, you know, that much solace back to the, back to the family because George Floyd is still he's still gone but you know what what does it mean it, it seems for me a very small victory step in in such a much larger issue well you know i know bishop ward said that there were several cases uh where there were convictions i have to find them i don't have that recollection and that there were a lot and i'm not disputing that what they had but i can tell you of the number of cases uh, where there have been police shootings, uh, where there have been either persons, uh, black people killed or maimed, uh, there, uh, this, there's only been a small percentage of, of convictions. Uh, and in the most recent times, I can, I can, this is the, I believe the first of the more recent day uh, within the past 10 years. So for me, having served on the uh, reform task, Boston Police Department task force for the city of Boston, what this says for me is there is an opportunity here for what I what I said during that time. We in the black black and brown community want the police to honor the same code that they honor in every other community, and that is to protect and serve. And that's what we were not getting. So as a result of this, I, and there's two ways I said we were going to get it by you following the rules, or we're going to be get it by you paying the price for violating the rules. This is an instance where you, one has paid the price for violating the rules. So it's a step in the right direction. Uh, Tonya, how much of a step it's going to be remains to be seen. I think it will energize us who are in the reform mindset, in the reform movement around uh, police community relations. I started I, can't, I was in the first class of the College of Criminal Justice at Northeastern University in 1967 when they were, you know, they were trying to do CEO. Uh, they had the OEO. They wanted to put money into the uh, into the various cities throughout the country, the federal government, when, and one of them was around police. So I'm hopeful that we are there. But one other point before I move on, I wanted to respond or elaborate on something that Bishop Young said. They had so many national guards in Minneapolis. Now, you know, when we talked about the, uh, you know, about the insurrection, yes. yeah. what did I call it? I said, I, you know, I took you back to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the, my mafia movies and Godfather and said, what happened down there reminded me of exactly what happened when Michael Corleone went around to the hospital to, uh, to visit his dad and found that there was no police protection. Well. They had none of that down there when they had all the announcements. But as soon as there's a potential for black folks to, uh, yeah. and who are usually nonviolent and usually are not the ones who are the perpetrators of, of the of violence, they have a militarized zone. So I think we have to take into account- In many cities, that. in many cities, not just many- Well, that's right, you know, yes. Well, so what I'm saying is preparedness when it's black people Mm -hmm. unpreparedness or that is not going to be an impact when it's white folks. So I'm not going to let them get away with just simply saying that they can have a sigh of relief because of the verdict. They were prepared in this instance when they were not on January 6th. And I think that the question is, why not? 
Yeah, Pastor Young, I know that you're involved with your uh, police uh, com uh, community in Haverhill and you were a part of, um, you know, working with the police with the Black Lives Matter group up there. So, you know, when, when Attorney Feaster talks about reform and, and what we need to do now, talk about some of the things that you're speaking with with the police force up there. Yes, so I uh, have chaired the diversity committee here for the city of Haverhill. Um, the way things are written, you know, when it comes to uh, force, use of force, I mean, it was really great as far as when can you use use of force. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we came out of the meeting with was understanding or at least trying to push towards some psychological examination. Right, so they do take, from our understanding, they do take psych, uh, like a psych exam before going in, but what happens during the whole entire time? Uh, is there enough training? And so when we had like a sit down, this is a public, I mean, this is a public forum. Uh, I was just shocked and almost fell out of my chair when uh, the deputy said, I, didn't, I haven't heard of this phrase, uh, microaggression, until I took a class at uh, the Kennedy School in leadership about three years ago. Wow. And I was saying, you know, all of us, uh, people of color that sit in this chair understand not just microaggression, we understand aggression. And so, uh, and I never forget, I never forget leaving that. And it was a kind of a tense moment. And I said, you know, you all have the opportunity to make a mistake and it's okay. I said, but for black people, making a mistake and cause us our life. And so I think about that when I look at Dante Wright, whether or not we say, well, he shouldn't have, he just should have just sat in the car. He should have just went with the police, whether he was afraid for his life or whatever. If that was a mistake, he's no longer here because he made a mistake. And there's other people that we know can say whatever they want to say, swear, spit, whatever. And they just tell them to go back home. And that's, 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 those are some of the conversations that we're having. Well, in fact, some of them get sandwiches there, Bishop. Uh, you know. <laughs> Burger King, right? <laughs> that's right. There you go. <laughs> you know, um, Bishop Ward, and, and you and I have had these conversations as well, because, you know, this Black Lives Matter movement has primarily been a young people's movement. And we're seeing how quickly they are organizing and getting to these places when, when circumstances like George Floyd and Dante Wright, and now what we're seeing with Adam Toledo. Um, but there, but how are we kind of managing their feelings? Like as, as a bishop, talk about how we are managing their feelings and, and what we can say to our young people right now about how, how to kind of just, you know, maneuver in these very, very difficult and sometimes very hard and frustrating times. That, that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, as I'm talking to young people, particularly I have sons who are millennials, and as we engage in conversations about these particular this particular incident, um, I tell them that you know what, this is something that has been going on, and you have been in the place where you can actually see it because technology has exposed you a lot more to what we've been talking about that you couldn't see. Um, and now that you see this, of course, our response is to be, you know, how do, how do you take what you feel and not channel it in the wrong direction, but to channel that energy in the very positive direction? Uh, now that you're old enough, do you vote? Now that you're old enough, do you, do you actually engage in civic engagement activities? Um, do you understand that, yes, being an African-American male in America is a dangerous thing. And I've been telling telling them, you know, it's you, this, this has been, I think it's kind of like a, a Joshua taking the land of Canaan battle. You're not gonna win it all. You gotta first take take one thing, one step at a time. And I know you, I know they're anxious to get it all at once. I said, but you know what? What we have now, people have fought for years to get. And so you are just part of that legacy. And I want you to know, you know what? You got to do your part. We're not always going to be here, but you got to do your part. Join in and get together with the older generation 
and start to start to take your place. Uh, so how, how they feel about it? Yes, they're emotional. But I said, your emotions are not going to get the job done. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to engage and you're going to have to be a strategist. You're going to have to think. You're going to have to now put down, put down whatever advices that you got so that you can be clear headed and approach it in a, in a very systematic, systematic way. So it's a, it's a, it's a process I think of mentoring with them. And I think that even as the older generation, as, as an older guy, been, you know, came through the sixties, you know, lived in Roxbury, dealt with my community being burnt down with, with, with uh, Dr. King being killed um, and going through all of that. I, I feel it's my responsibility to do all I can to try to inform, to mentor, and to help them not just be emotional about it, but also be thoughtful people and engage to, to bring us to another place. You know, one of the other things that came out in the last several days in getting back to the legal aspect of this trial is when Judge Peter Cahill publicly reprimanded Representative Maxine Waters for making what he called irresponsible and disrespectful comments about the case. Uh, just as the jurors were um, set out to deliberate yesterday and hinted that this could be cause for an appeal. Joe, does that hold any water to you? Well, I will do a disclaimer. I started off my career wanting to be a criminal lawyer after growing up around Perry Mason and F. Lee Bailey when they were good, but uh, I don't practice in criminal law or too much trial work, but I, I will try to respond to that from my own impression, being a political person that I am, and, and so some comparisons. But if you wouldn't mind me, a little digression for a minute, uh, Tanya, on one issue. I would like us to imagine what would have happened, because you mentioned uh, Bishop Ward about technology. Just imagine what this case outcome would have been without that, without that uh, tape. Let's be real. Do you think that we would have had this conviction? <clears throat> No. Without the tape, when we're sitting there with trepidation, uncertainty, with with the with the amount of evidence that we had, so just think what the outcome would have been without the tape, and what would have been said about George Floyd was oh he was resisting, and et cetera. It wasn't excessive force; it was enough force I had to use. So, I want us to hold that picture in our mind in terms of our thoughts, and then when you start as you asked the uh, Bishop Ward about what we, what our young people should be doing. It's quite interesting, earlier today, as we were uh, trying to determine, because it's like you, Bishop Ward, we didn't think that the verdict was gonna be until sometime uh, later in the week, if, if, if not next week. I got a call from James Morton, the CEO of the Boston y, uh, YMCA. Um, also Thaddeus um, Miles from Be, Be A Ma'am or, or BAM and also My Brother's Keepers, which James uh, of Boston, which James Morton and I coach here. We're going to try to put together some type of, um, along with the city of Boston, some type of convening of a conversation so we can have with our young people. So again, it's going to be important, Bishop, where we're going to step up as those elders in order to be able to address that. So I think that that was important. Uh, the judge did what he had to do with regards to the comments of, that were made by Maxine Waters. Where the disingenuousness comes from, it comes from the Ted Cruz's of the world and the Republican Party. And I'm so glad that uh, Speaker Pelosi rejected the, the censure call. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, external pieces, you know, jurors are told to dis, uh, disregard anything other than what they've heard through the testimony and what the instructions that they received from the judge. The judge as well told them after the defense closed their closing argument that no, some of what defense counsel said was not what was in evidence. So yes, defense is gonna take all those issues up on appeal, but my my view is they will all fail. What, what, what Congresswoman Maxine Waters says, what President Biden had to say, uh, even though it was post sequestering of the jury, I really don't think that it's going to be something that's going to be found to uh, overturn and, and cause for a new trial. A new trial. That's my view. Um, so I think that so the political pundits on the Republican side, the Fox News of the world, they're going to try to make hay of that. 
But I want to say, if they think Maxine Waters' statements were bad, just go back to January 6th. And if, if she gets censured, we got a guy sitting in Florida that needs to be censored. We got a person that joined him on that podium needs to be censored. We have some Congress people that are sitting that need to be censored. So that's how I would respond to that. But I don't think in response, direct response to your question, I don't think her statements would result in uh, uh, the overturning of the verdict. Uh, gentlemen, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I, I want to ask in all sincerity, and I know it's a question that always comes up after we go through this, whether whether, whether the verdict came back in favor of uh, convicting him or not. The question is always asked, where do we go from here? I mean, we, we still have, as Pastor Ken mentioned, we still have Dante Wright, the officer, has been uh, arrested in that case. She has been charged. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in Chicago with 13-year-old Adam Toledo. Um, and unfortunately, it's just becoming too common of a story. So where do we go? How do we start the healing? And I'll start with you, Pastor Ken. How do we start the healing? That is a million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> I do want to speak to the whole um, Joshua piece as well. Um, since I am the youngest one on, on the panel, <laughs> I do think um, this sense of, uh, of you also have to follow in order to lead. I do believe in that. I think there's a disconnect from an older generation to the younger generation. I heard Bishop Ward talk about MLK, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You have younger people, whether we want to call them the IGN generation, whatever we want to name them, that is so far away. Like that's so distant, like civil rights movement, especially in the city of Boston. They don't, it's, that's a different world. Um, being from Georgia, it's not that far away from me. Um, you know, being from the South and seeing different things and understanding the language and understanding my grandmother and seeing cotton fields, that's not that far away from me. Um, and so I think having a conversation is great. I think that's the first place we need, need to start. I think some of the things you're gonna find is that you have a young generation who feel like I don't, I shouldn't have to fight this fight, and so some of that pent up anger is because we are supposed to be over this by now. And I think more conversations are needed. You know, I'm not one to say defund the police, but I will say we need to reform um, the police. Um, you know, one thing that I, I said to my mayor: so why do we have police in the schools? That's the first. That's the first interaction we want to have is uh, one of the kids getting in a fight that the police don't come and lock them up versus having counselors available to figure out what's going on. And so I think those are some of the things that we need to look at. Where do we put police where police are not supposed to be? And so I think a lot of time in our society, we have placed police in area that they're not trained or equipped to work in. And so therefore we do get things like, oh, I thought it was my taser and it wasn't. Oh, um, when I think about the guy in South Carolina, which was, uh, I think he was dealing with autism. I just saw another clip of boys who were riding a bicycle yeah. in New Jersey. Then the bikes have to be registered. Who would have thought you have to register a bicycle? And the police like came in, was like, we're gonna take your bike. And they locked the young young guys up for riding a bicycle in the street. I, I mean, so some of that stuff is just, I think it's too much um, as, as religious leaders. I think we have, we have to hold up our hands and say, you know what? We hadn't done our job good enough either. I think we have to be honest and transparent and say, you know, it's some things we should have been doing. Instead of preaching wealth and and uh, and all this other stuff, you grab, reach up and grab it and all this. We should have been out trying to do a better job of educating our parishioners and making sure they know what's actually going on. Understanding government, the way it's supposed to work. Understanding civics, because we have generations upon generations who do not understand civics. Why should I vote? Right? What is the mayor going to do for me? What are my council persons going to do for me? People don't understand that. And so they feel like they don't have a voice. But when things do happen, their uh, sometimes uh, articulation is the, the burn stuff down, is so I can get your attention. And I'll leave you with this. I never forget I was watching a documentary uh, with uh, Freddie Gray uh, in Baltimore. This guy said, um, I live in the row houses where no one cares anything about us until they see smoke. 
And when they see smoke, then they finally call police in and call the fire people in to see what's actually going on. He said, we literally have to burn something down in order for us to get the help that we need. And so I think sometimes we're, we're living in that state where you have younger people who feel like the school system is failing, criminal justice is failing, society is failing. And so we literally have to burn stuff down in order for our voices to be heard. Wow. Uh, Bishop Ward, where do we go from here? Well, after that one, <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big question, um, of course. And when I think about what that answer might be is the question is, I'm questioning what role do I have to play? Um, what, what in the story is my role? Um, I can't do everything. I can't, I can't protest at the same time and take care of the church and take care, you know, there's, there's a role that I have. And I, and I think that when it comes to this season of time, we, you know, it's, it's an awakening season. I mean, we talked about 2020, 2020 is the year of vision. Oh yeah, it's a year of vision because of the pandemic and all the racism. Yeah, we're woke now, our eyes are open. We didn't think it was gonna be this way, but this is what's happening. And so the question is, now that we, we've been awakened um, to a number of issues from our health concerns, to our economic situation, to racism, um, and, and even our, our, our Asian our Island Pacific brothers and sisters, you know, they, they, they are just scared on many fronts when it comes to racism. And I've had conversations with them. Now that we're, we're awakened to, to some things, I think my question would be now, what might be your role in the healing of your of, of the environments that you're in? What, what would be God's role for you or your place? And whatever that might be, you have to you have to now take take responsibility. You can't just blame it on the police or this or that. There's something that you need to do about your situation and you can do it with the unity and joining in and being a part of the solution rather than the problem. So, you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard question, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to look at it in terms of what would my role be as a spiritual leader, as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband, what is my role in taking my place? And uh, Attorney Feaster, we're going we began with you and we're gonna leave have you leave us with your final thoughts. Well, thank you very much, and I'm so happy to be on both with Bishop Young, Bishop Ward, and Officer Tanya, always with you. Um, for me, uh, you know, I um, there's not a cause for celebration. I don't feel a sense of celebration here. Uh, it was lost all the way around. No matter what the outcome of this verdict is, George Floyd is is dead. Two families are are destroyed. Multiple people have been impacted and. Uh, Bishop Young, you talked about, you know, folks going to have some PTSD effects as the result of this, standing there watching a person die before you in nine minutes and 29 seconds. So it's all the way around. But what can we do? Yeah, we have to take this, take this, so we have to take this as a victory, not a celebration. We take this as a victory. So we take this here and we get more involved in police reform across this country. We have to get some national rules in terms of some national standards. We have to get rid of qualified immunity. We have to deal with, uh, you know, what what use of force standards will be, whether it's in Haverhill, Boston, uh, you know, wherever it might be. And, and we have to have a sense of accountability. So that's on the part of of systems. We as people, young or old, you got to get involved, you got to get engaged. We got to deal with voting, we got to deal with building wealth. My view is if you don't have uh, uh, wealth and you don't have political power, you have no power. So, so my sense of it is we have to shape that. So if there's anything I can tell young people uh, as to what they need to do, I'm a product of the civil rights movement. Uh, so therefore, I was a beneficiary of the civil rights movement. And so as a result of it, to have them, Bishop Young, if, if, if they don't know the history, that's because we didn't do our job. We didn't do our job for them to learn the history. I teach my, I'm teaching my 10 year old grandson. He got to know what it is. I'm gonna send him here. These are the Tuskegee Airmen. I'm, I'm giving them material. So I think that if, if we can use our churches, like our Jewish brothers and sisters do, 
in order to teach our history so folks know that no, this isn't the first time that police have been used in order to control a certain, to control black people. That's what the whole slave trade trade, and, and the ones who the slave catchers were from the time of slavery. So there's some parallels that are there. We need to teach them, but looking ahead, we got to get engaged. We got to get involved. We got to build wealth. We got to deal with our voting. We got to be political. We got to get done. We got to be in our churches, being spiritual. We need to organize and get the job done. Attorney Joseph Feaster, Bishop Lawrence Ward, and Pastor Kenneth Young, I thank you all for joining me this evening on this live presentation of the Power Play Show to discuss the verdict in the case uh, against Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Um, I thank you for your thoughts and your insights. And for those who are watching, we, we wish you to stay safe and to stay vigilant. And we uh, all pray for peace in Minneapolis and other communities this evening. And we hope that, you know, things will go well. So again, thank you. I am your host, Tonya McGrath. On behalf of those for the Power Play Show, good night. <laughs>